Things don't always go to plan, and sometimes that's the best thing, especially when the original plan was not to be a clothing designer. My guest was at his cubicle working, but spending all this time learning about clothes. He never even wanted a business. He just wanted to hem his pants. And well, things went way off from there. My name is Jeremy Kirkland, and this is Blamo, a podcast exploring the world of fashion with the people who shape it. My guest this week is Dan Snyder, founder and designer of Corridor. Dan and I discuss working at IBM and the FBI, how making sure it started as a hobby and turned into a business, and how objects become extensions of ourselves and what it means to share them. So wait, where are you from originally? I'm from Columbia, Maryland, which is like a suburb outside Baltimore. It's between Baltimore and D.C. Okay. So, wow. All right. So you grew up around there. What, what, what was life like? I mean, you're obviously reading a ton, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, I'm from, Columbia is a planned community. It's the first planned community in the country. And so... Planned community? Yeah, it was the first planned community. So the idea was this man, James Rouse, bought all this land. And he wanted every plot of, not plot, but rather like community to have a village center and have every economic group and to be completely connected by bike lanes. So you could walk anywhere, you could walk to your grocery store and that the communities would be very diverse. So every school would have every, every single type of person. Um, and I grew up in that and it doesn't, it doesn't totally function like that now, but I think I got the 1.0 version before people self segregated. And I had this, I had like a really nice upbringing where I was surrounded by different types of people. And, you know, my elementary school was next to public housing. My middle school was next to a dairy farm. And then the high school was a mixture of the two. Whoa. Yeah. That, I mean, that, it almost sounds kind of like a utopia in a way. I think that's what he meant. He meant for it to be, um, you know, and utopias don't really function in the real world because people are, you know, people are people. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but it really worked for me. And, uh, you know, I, I love growing up there and my parents are still there. So you, you go to school there and then what, when, cause you eventually kind of make your way to like the, the public sector, right? I mean, mm-hmm. did you, what happened from that? Do you, where'd you go to school after that? I went to Penn State. Okay. I, I went and I wanted to study literature, English, and my parents were like, you're not going to get a job. And uh, I said, you're right. And so I switched <laughs> to IT and uh, I got a job right out of school and I worked for IBM in their like federal practice. And uh, I worked on, I worked in a cubicle and it, I learned a lot and I worked with really smart people. Um, and from there I went became a contractor at Homeland Security. And then from what there, year is this? Um, I really don't know. I mean, I guess over, certainly over a decade ago. Okay. Yeah. And so wait, hold on. When you study like IT, uh-huh. like what are the things? Because I always think it's really interesting for people who go to school for a lot of the technical stuff because so much stuff has evolved from that. Um, when, when you were, were you studying like programming language is this like c++ type stuff you're learning yeah yeah so, okay so i basically what i was in something that was like computer science light you okay know, for for people that like aren't smart enough to be in computer science more or less so you study computer um computer languages c++ java all that all that stuff discrete math um and then you also study project management so how to build digital products how to work on digital products how to how to you know create stuff digitally and work right. in teams um and that's basically that's basically the major um mm-hmm. interesting were you like did you get into gaming or anything around this time no i've never i've never been to gaming except for one game which i it's like scratches all of my itches which is Sid Meier's Civilization, which is like, oh, okay, which is like the nerdiest thing that like I I, I started playing it like when I was like in fifth grade, and it's like uh, the the longest, most boring game ever. And for some reason, I just whenever I played it, I just like would be gone for eight hours. 
Can you explain what civilization is? Or I'm, I'm happy to, to butcher it. Yeah, sure. It's a strategy game that you take a civilization from the Stone Age to the modern age with uh, technology. And this is so nerdy. Uh, no, 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 no. This is awesome. Because I'm, I'm secretly and publicly, I guess, a pretty big gamer. I played civilization a ton. And uh, it's, it's infinitely interesting. And there's so well, many... Because you ad- build stuff. I mean, that's stuff. the thing, too. Like, you, you're, you're kind of creating you know, this civilization, but you're also choosing what things to build, you know, you're harvesting raw materials, you're, and you're on like a, a, a little planet, right? Yeah, yeah, you're on planet Earth, and it, you know, the continents are different, but this, the civilizations are, are the same. And eventually my sister had to destroy the CD-ROM to break my addiction. Um, <laughs> I've, re- I've since relapsed multiple times, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I'm, currently, I'm currently sober, um, and uh, I, I want to I stay that way. Oh, see, I got, when Civilization came out for, I think, like the iPad, this was when iPads, there wasn't really anything you could do on them. Like, when, do you remember when iPads first came out, everyone was like, it's kind of cool, but it's basically just a big iPhone, and, you know, the only apps that worked were... <clears throat> were basically the standard, like, it, they weren't even calling it iOS yet, but they were just, like, the standard installed apps. But I remember one of the first games that was made for an iPad was Civilization, and I got way back into it. It was nuts. I think I, like, blew off two conference calls in my old job. I was, I was going hardcore in Civ. I think it was, like, Civ 4, maybe? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> I, I ruined friendships. That I, is so awesome. I, I really, I, I, I've since installed and deleted that app many times. It's better. Well, I guess it's better to be into that than say Counter Strike. My freshman year roommate essentially flunked out of college because of his addiction to Counter Strike. Really? Yeah. So my my uh, my freshman year dorm, it sounded like Baghdad, like all the time because he played it on like big speakers. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I know that game. <laughs> I, don't, I, never, I never played it, but uh, I know the game. Yeah, that's basically just like a PvP kill, kill the guy. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, okay, so, so you then work for IBM and you somehow find your way as a contractor. Mm-hmm. Was that, wh- what was that like? I mean, you don't have to like reveal like top secret details or anything, but like what... What did it feel like to to be in more of like the public sector or did it, did it feel any different? Um, it only felt different. It didn't feel different working for IBM. Right. Um, it felt different when I got kind of like when I started working in like federal buildings and you start working closer to quote unquote the mission. Uh, mm-hmm. That feels, that feels different. When you work for IBM, you feel like you're still, well, or I felt, I felt like I was still working for a big blue IBM, you know? Right. Yeah. That was interesting. And what sort of stuff were you working on? This, again, is so boring, but I'll tell you. I, I worked on the analog to digital conversion project. So when the government sold the bunny ears signal, they needed to distribute these coupons so you could buy digital converter boxes. Oh, yeah, because it was when people were getting, like, HD over the air, right? I worked on that, yeah. It's really fascinating stuff. Wait, no, that is fascinating. <laughs> Because, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, this is all about, like, radio frequency stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you think about it and you think about security now, like, everything is RF-based. Because, mm-hmm. uh, wh- what was it? I mean, uh, do you remember having a cordless phone? And I remember, like, certain homes, like, right when Wi-Fi came out. So, super, super old school Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi radio band was a lot of times the same band as these bigger cordless phones. And so you'd try to turn on your phone and your phone wouldn't work because the Wi-Fi was on. And you'd have to, un- you know, because I think it was 2.4 gigahertz at the time, but it was just like, hey, wait, and that's you and you're working on that? I was working on that. How does, what, what, what the heck? It's, uh, I, I, I can't even explain it now. I probably couldn't explain it at the time either, but uh, people got coupons, they got converter boxes. And uh, it somehow worked. It was a government project that actually worked, I, I think. <laughs> yeah. And so all alongside, because obviously we're here to talk about your clothing brand, all alongside, are you getting into clothes? Is this, where, where did this stuff sort of come in or was it way earlier? 
No, it, it wasn't. It wasn't earlier. Um, I I had you know studied abroad, you know, as typically someone does in in college, and so I kind of tasted the first bits of that. And I'm from Maryland, so there is this Nantucket red prep thing happening. And yeah, yeah. And also, just like everybody who grew up in mid '90s, like I had a skateboard and skated horribly, and got kind of into that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was always going through it, but I, I was never really, really interested in it. I was more interested in sports and books and things like that. And it wasn't until Menswear 1.0 happened where I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, and Men's that's 1.0. Yeah, yeah. Well, Menswear 1.0. And I think right now we're on like 3 or 4.0 or something like sure. that. Um, or we're moving towards 4.0. And that's when I started, you know, I got the Tumblr and the RSS reader and my man yeah how to talk to girls at parties and looking in my cubicle on my rss reader and i was like this is this is interesting yeah yeah, yeah. that's when it happened and i was at homeland security by that point interesting yeah because i feel like there's so many people that because of working in a cubicle and working on the internet you know or, or excuse me working on a job where basically you're connected 24 7 as part and you of that have job. to dress well at the job or you should anyway because you, you wear a sports coat every day to, well, I, I wore a sports coat every day to work. Yeah. Was everyone else around there? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. It was a federal building. So, so th- there were real dress codes at that time. Yeah. What, what was like, what was your day to day wear over there? I wore a tie every day. Really? Mm-hmm. I rode my bike from wherever I was living in DC at the time in a suit to work, parked my bike in, in the parking garage and, you know. Hopefully, I didn't get too much oil in my pants. <laughs> you know, that's awesome. Wait, it, DC style, by the way, is a, almost a whole other podcast because there's so many of, you know, there's a lot of people say like, oh, DC is all these like ill-fitting suits, and everyone was saying they're too big. But I was in DC recently, and all the people that I saw wearing suits, it, I actually would say they were like crazy tight, mm. like all these young sort of whether you like them or not, like Jared Kushner lookalike dudes with like very, very tiny suits and tiny, super aggressive tapers. And Mm -hmm. was it, was that like starting to to happen there? I was starting to happen, but you know, that's like leftover stuff, you know, that's, that's like, I think the tight suits, they'll eventually move out of that. It's almost like uh, maybe, maybe even you or I were, thought that tight suits were cool five years ago yeah and uh, you know in five years from now they folks won't be wearing tight suits so it's almost like the trickle down the trickle down economics right. of, <laughs> of of styling right. um reaganomics of suits the reaganomics <laughs> of suits so uh at that point at that point in dc it was like just olive joseph a bank balloon suits uh, okay at the time and I'm, i don't think that's true anymore and i think there's certainly more options yeah yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. A lot of the British tailors um, that I know, they talk about their biggest cities are not New York. They're D.C. and sometimes uh, like Chicago or Boston, but it's always D.C. Because I, I guess like D.C. just gets overlooked, but there's so much, you know, there and also still one of the only places that has a really strong mandatory dress code. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of lawyers there too. Yeah. So you are... Sitting in your cubicle, mm-hmm. you're getting into menswear, mm. but again, a business doesn't really cross your mind. No, I never wanted a business. <laughs> I was never interested in business at all. Okay, yeah. So, so how does this how does this start to to evolve? So, there's like the other side is that like my mother is an artist, and I come from a family of artists, and my mother teaches at or taught at MICA, the Maryland Institute of Art, mm-hmm. and so I could. I could always draw. I always had this ability to, to do this sort of thing. And uh, I guess part of it was that I've been working on computers for so long. And I was like, man, it would be interesting to, to do something physical. So, mm. And so I decided I wanted to learn to sew. And so I got my aunt's 1970s Kenmore sewing machine. That's a big pivot. It wasn't a pivot, though. It wasn't a pivot. It was just a hobby. Okay. Yeah, it was just something I wanted to do on the side. I wasn't interested in, like, becoming a designer. I didn't think about, like, oh, I need a clothing company. Like, this was not in my brain. So you don't think of, this is fine, but you don't think of 
your life as like these five year steps. You're it, it sounds like you're just you have an idea. Let's just check it out. It's not that oh, I have the end goal before I even start the I, start working on the idea. Yeah, totally. It okay. ever, I think my life is. It certainly hasn't been perfect, but it's felt natural. Like everything, like I didn't like before get a sewing sewing machine. Like I want a, I want a clothing business. Like I want to, yeah, I want to open a store in New York. No, I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to hem my pants. Okay. (laughs) That's all I wanted to do. Sure. And so I didn't even know I wanted to like make shirts. I just wanted to be able to hem my pants. And because I had all these suits, I was going to this, this tailor in DC and I became friends with him and we started playing tennis and I was like, this is cool. So I got this sewing machine and I signed up for sewing classes Mm -hmm. and, you know, I learned how to thread a bob and, and, you know, but I, at this point, like, I didn't know what a cutter's must was. I didn't know how to work on a production pattern. I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what a source fabric. All I knew what, where Joanne, Joanne's fabric was. That's all. That's all I know. Nice. And uh, so I signed up for classes and I, I like really liked it and I thought I was good at it. And so soon after, um, kind what of made you think you were good at it. Um, the shirts, well, I guess I'll get I, the shirts I made initially. I still look at those shirts. And I'm like, those were good shirts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were good. Um, what, what about them were good? I think, uh, the fabrics. Okay. You know, like I knew, uh, you know, like I know color. Gotcha. I really, like, I still think like, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that from especially your, your clothing. Thank you. But yeah, My, I just like intrinsically, I like, I know color. Um, and so I, you know, the cuffs were, you know, all fucked up, and, you know, like raw edges here and <laughs> the sewing, like, you know, it, it was technically a shirt. Okay. And like it, the shape looked good and you know, there were, you know, you could, there was enough buttons. Um, and I, I started making shirts because I was like, oh, I can learn all the tailoring techniques if I know how to make a shirt. I can apply a collar. I can hem a sleeve. That's true. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to make shirts. And so I just went to town making shirts. And that was like my hobby. And that's all I ever thought it was. Had you ever made anything for yourself beforehand? No. Okay. So no computers, no, uh, no physical things. This was like your first physical iteration of something for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird feeling when that happens, right? I, I especially, I mean, I think you and I come from a similar background where so much of the things we had made were intangible. That when you start to make something that's physical and that other people can physically see and also judge for themselves, it's kind of a weird feeling. I don't know. May, maybe, maybe I'm just projecting on you and I apologize, but... It, it just, it, it felt weird to me when I started to just try to make something for myself like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I was, I was proud of it and I was happy yeah. to wear it. Yeah. I, I, I recently was thinking about, um, the way I made, I made a shirt this season and it's, it's a really nice, it's a really beautiful shirt and has like the right hand and the right color and something that's going to hold up for a long time. And in the copy I wrote about how I thought this, the shirt would be nice. Hold on, you write your own copy? I write all the copy on the website. All right, we're going to have to talk about that later because that's really interesting too. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I thought like this would be a shirt that would be so nice if like I wore it for two or three years and I gave it to somebody. And I think there's just something so nice about like having a garment or a book, but particularly a garment, something like you've broken in and like becomes you and then you give it to somebody. That's, that's really something so beautiful in that. Yeah, and see, and you can't do that with an intangible object. No. You can, you can do it with a book, but with a book, it, you know, maybe they'll read it once or they'll see your dog ears and maybe you sneezed in the book or whatever. And, <laughs> but it sits, on, it sits on the shelf. But, right. but with a shirt, you're like, okay, or like it's broken in in this way. And it's really, you know, you're giving somebody a piece of Jeremy. And I don't know. I ha- agree. And like something to do with like having your own product, it's the same sort of gift. It's your yeah. same sort of energy. Because, like, if you love this shirt and you wore this shirt and, like, it's like, you believe this or you don't, like, this energy transference where, like, you're giving somebody a piece of you. See? See? Okay. So you do know what I'm talking about. It's yeah. that feeling. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It, it's just, it, especially when it's, it's something that, whether it's collaborated with other people, it, whatever, it, it, it comes from your head mm-hmm. where, you know, the experience 
of you having the idea, thinking about how that's going to look, and then the manifestation of that to a physical piece is something that I think is one of the greatest, you can tell I'm not a drug user, by the way, is one of the greatest highs I've ever felt when you, you're like, okay, I, you know, I thought about this, there was an edit, we, we worked, we created, and now it's in my hand. Yeah, but I, the one thing I'll say is like, I don't, and not to sound like too new agey, but I don't think it, it, comes, from, it comes from deeper than that. Like, like something that you really love and something you really appreciate. Some things do come from your head and other things come from like, Oh, uh, okay. You know, they really do. You, I mean, you, you pointed to your heart. Yeah, they come from your soul. You yeah. come from like inside you. Inside okay. you, whatever that is. Yeah. All right. I'm with you there. It's, I mean, it's, it's true because there's, there's more emotion to that versus... Yeah. There's feeling. There's intensity. There's vibration. There's, there's energy. And like things that are really, really a part of you. Mm-hmm. Like when you give them to somebody else, it's like, it's not logical. It's like, it's something more. My mother-in-law is a quilter. And when I mean quilter, it's not like, oh, she just, she says she does it as a hobby, but she's, I mean, she's made like full-blown quilts, multiple quilts for years and years and years. And she made a quilt for my daughter when my daughter was born. And I almost like get choked up thinking about this, but it was like, it's this blanket, you know, this little quilt thing that's just for her and then you know it's got her name on it and stuff but it's like the amount of time and effort and energy and hours of physical labor that my mother-in-law spent to make this for my daughter it's huge yeah 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 and that's that's like how we're attracted to objects and people and yeah. things like that it's that 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 like object is like imbued with something yeah, yeah. You know, and, and you, you know, you know it when you see it, you know, it when you, you feel it, you know, like yeah. we, we know. Okay. Okay. So, so you make these shirts for yourself mm. and what does that do? Uh, it just gives me satisfaction. Um, and I just enjoyed the process. I enjoyed the process of, of making it. And, and it, I did not think, oh yeah, these shirts are great. I should sell them to other people. I, I did not. It's just... Just for pure selfish, just, making it for yourself. Just for me. Just yeah. for me. Um, I enjoyed it. I, it, was my, it was my hobby. Like, I played soccer. I went to work. I, and that's, that's, and I made shirts. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's what I did for a, a while. And it, it wasn't until much later that this turned into a business. And again, like, I think maybe sometimes people think, like, I wanted a business. But it, I, I didn't. Like, this was just, this was just for play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when does it start to become a business though? Because obviously you start making these things Were were people commenting about it. Did anyone were like, Hey, what's that? You made a shirt. Like what, what made you was, did that conversation take place with, you know, people at your office? What was that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think what I made was good. It was, it was good product mm-hmm. and uh, more and more people asked for it. Um, like a lot of people asked for it. If I, if I wore it, I felt like I got a compliment every, every time. And it was like, I made like a, just a beautiful black watch shirt that was just, just right pattern matched, right colors, but a little different, you know, just like a inside out black watch. Mm -hmm. Um, and some other motifs that were, you know, really was like made from couch material or or something drapery, but it was, it was the right motif and it was the, the right time for that motif before these like kind of ditzy prints were happening. Um, just as, just as a side note, what were the things that were inspiring you when you're seeing, when you're picking out these fabrics to make? Did you have this sort of, you know, a lot of designers will talk about how they have a mood board and that's, that's kind of where, or were you just seeing these things and experimenting? I, I just, I, I think I definitely didn't have a mood board. <laughs> um, um, the things they just kind of happen like intrinsically. Okay. I think like I, I understand, like, like I said about color and repeat and space. Um, and so it was just things that were appealing to me, mm. why they were appealing to me at the time. I, I couldn't articulate that. I, right. I didn't have the terminology. I think now I, I know why they were good and it was because they were, they were familiar, but they were a little different and they were, progressive but not too progressive and that sort of thing which is kind of still what i do today Mm -hmm. which is i intrinsically feel like an 
an energy or I feel a quality to something that is appealing and I, I can't always say why. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess like, yeah. So to kind of move on to like why, when it kind of became something. Um, so I wanted to switch from FBI to CIA. I wanted to be as one does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wait, how did you get to the FBI? Uh, I was working for a contractor in DC and, and a spot opened up on, cause the, the FBI wasn't doing the, the HD boxes. No, 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 they weren't doing the HD boxes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was at, then I went to Homeland security, um, before I was at FBI, but anyway, so I worked for a contractor and the contractor had an open spot at the FBI. And so the contractor put me on the FBI project. And so I was there for, I don't know, two years or something like that. What was the, are you at liberty to discuss what the project was you were working on? It, it was, you know. Uh, Respect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that was very interesting. Um, In what way? Well, I, you know, the reason I kind of like this stuff and why I wanted to, you know, enter this world is because it's, it's from like, you're just kind of in on something and it's, it's like you think you're impacting the world and your job has impact and there's mission and there's like purpose and there's real purpose to the work or at least like, I believe my job had purpose and it gave me satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I, I really liked the work. Um, I thought it, I thought it mattered. Yeah. You're saying it past tense. Like it, like it doesn't. Oh, I, I'm just talking about my life. Okay. I think, I think in terms of purpose and meaning, um, I think there doesn't, the, one's job doesn't need to give them purpose. I don't think that's, that's a requirement. Mm -hmm. I think that you can, I think one needs to find purpose in their life. And, and if, by being a good father, by being a great gardener, by doing whatever they do in their life to, to, to create that structure. But, you know, one needs to find purpose. And that, that time in my life, my late 20s, my purpose was this work. And so that gave me the satisfaction I needed to, like, that was, like, the framework for, like, what I could hold on to, you know? Yeah. And so, like, this is, like, this whole, like, man search for meaning stuff. Okay, well, you know, we're getting some Victor Frankl stuff going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And that's, like, the distillation of the book, right? Yeah. Which is, like, your, one's life needs to have purpose and maybe not structure but purpose and what that is is important yeah and for me it was it was my job at that time interesting yeah i think a lot of specifically um well i don't know maybe not even specifically american but i think a lot of people feel that their um air quoting like identity purpose has to come from their career and and a lot of people they're able to get that you're able to have your identity through your career. You're able to, I mean, for me, I, I associate so much of my identity through what I'm doing now. But, you know, a lot of people, you'll hit this wall because you want something else to provide for you the thing that it feels you only really get through some form of self-discovery. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's why so many of us are glued to our phones. Or what, because it's like we're constantly trying to find out who we are and, and what we're supposed to be. Um, I mean, I, geez, I, I still wrestle with that to this day. Ooh, that's 10 other podcasts. But, <laughs> it's, but that, that's interesting that, you know, you, you are, you're working on that and your purpose is, is your career. Is you're, it feels like you're, you were running out of that and you're moving towards a different aspect of the federal government, which is the CIA. Yeah. I, I just wanted to go deeper. Like I wanted to go like, I guess like this, like deeper in myself or deeper in interest or however you want to take it. Sure. And, uh, so I went to grad school at Fletcher at Tufts, which has an international relations school. Mm -hmm. So I knew that they recruited from there and I got in there and, um, I went there and I, I got recruited. And so, it, um, yeah, that, that was the next step. Mm. And you're still making shirts? Now it's becoming more of a business for me, but only in the aspect that I'm doing, I'm, I'm tailoring people's clothes at school for money. Because now... Oh, okay. Now Just I'm, a little side, little side scratch. Yeah, because now I'm not, I, now I'm spending all of my money on grad school. <laughs> which, 
<laughs> you know, all my savings is for, for, for grad school. Sure. And uh, I'm like, okay, uh, you know, I can make a little money on the side and uh, then I'll work for a CIA and I'll be able to, you know, then I'll be okay. Mm-hmm. And then um, I think that the first year at school, more and more, uh, you know, now, now I'm not wearing a suit every day. So now I'm wearing my shirts every day to school and more and more people are asking about the, the clothes I'm wearing. And they're like, you should really turn this into a business. Um, and that's when I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe I should explore this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that summer I had a, uh, internship because you have to have a, it's a two year program and you have the full-time internship. And I worked at the NYPD counterterrorism division. Oh my God. Yeah. So I worked on like all the cameras, all the cameras all over New York. Wow. And, uh, and so that's a nine to five job. You know, and uh, at 5 p.m., I was like, I'm going to really try to figure this out. First thing I did, I got this book, this self-published book. Uh, if, like, anyone wants to start a clothing company and they, like, don't have any experience, they should buy this book. It's called The Entrepreneur's Guide to Sewn Product Manufacturing. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's on... It's, I thought you didn't like these types of books. I, I needed to know what a cutter's must was. I needed to know what a production pattern was. Right. It's not a business book. It's purely, like... An instruction it's, manual. It's, it's, yeah, it's instruction manual for gar- garment manufacturing. Like okay. it's, it's garment manufacturing for dummies. <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay. And it's like, what is a mood board? And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like, this seems like Tumblr. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Like everyone else, I'm sure you all are staying at home. What's your go-to at-home look these days? Is your Zoom background any good? What are the quarantine fits, people? If you're looking for inspiration and more, it's all available on the Polo app from Ralph Lauren. Yes, Ralph Lauren has an app, and it's the best of men's polo in the palm of your hand, featuring an edit of the most important pieces of the season, plus the icons that never go out of style. There's features from recent Blamo guests, such as Chris Black talking about how he's staying fit at home, Ralph Lauren himself's book and film recommendations, and yes, I wasn't kidding, Zoom backgrounds. I downloaded the Polo Bar background, so next time you see me on Zoom, I'll be at the Polo Bar, but the only thing I won't have is that Reuben sandwich. It's more than a place to shop polo, it's Ralph Lauren's polo in the palm of your hand. Download the Polo app on the iOS App Store and Google Play. Looking for that link? Just click it in the show notes and let me know what you get. Download the Polo app on the iOS App Store and Google Play. Available in the U.S. or U.K. And so um, I got this book and they're like, you, you need to find a factory. And I was like, okay, you need to make a production pattern. And so I, I, at 5 p.m. every day, I would go to the garment district. Mm-hmm. And I had never lived in New York. And I did not know anything. And... I was living with my friend's grandmother in Chelsea, and I would ride... Excuse me? Yeah, my friend's grandmother. I, I, again, I, I, I didn't have much money, so uh, my friend's grandmother's like, lived in a rank control apartment on thir- 23rd Street so forever. So you were like Tuesdays with Maury in the evening? I, re- I still see Carrie. I bring her uh, chicken from... from uh, what's that place in Chelsea? But anyway, I bring her rotisserie chicken. I, she's like my adopted grandmother. God bless you. Yeah. Well, no, God bless her. She gave me a very cheap rent. Okay. Um, Anyway, she was, she's, she's like a fantastic woman. She's like 95 and lives in New York on her own. And it's, it can be done anyway. Yeah. All right. All right. So at five, I would go up to the garment district and I would look at registers on 35th Street and 36th Street. And I would go up and I would look at like, okay, this looks like a factory sun, you know, sun manufacturing or whatever. And I would just knock on doors. What? Yeah. But yeah. Y- can't you use your private secret access and start finding all the companies online and do you weren't i this time at this time if there was a way to find companies online i didn't know how to do it okay like, okay and the, and i think since then there's there's plenty of these like consolidators of factories and i think that's only happened more recently or maybe i've only found out about it recently okay but i really knew nothing so I would go to the garment district and I would knock on doors. Which, as a side note, if that's not really something that is, I don't know, I, don't, I won't be rude, but I would say it's not really something that, dare I say, is really welcome 
to just show up at a factory and be like, hey, can I make this, right? A lot of those places, they're making stuff all day, right? They don't have like a customer-facing or even vendor-facing public, you know, office, do they? No. <laughs> okay. No, it was incredibly <laughs> awkward. Um, <laughs> and I got laughed at, like, out of every, almost every single place. Okay. Um, and number of false starts and... And but by the end of the, the the summer, I had met someone. His name was Ricky Sun, and he's I'm still close with him. And he has a factory on 35th Street. And at that time, they were making shirts for Stephen Allen and Rag and Bone and some oh, other. Oh snap! Okay, it's other you know other brands like that. And sure. it, it was a shirting factory, and they had a lot of the the factories in New York don't have the correct. And at this time, I like didn't even understand this. They don't have the correct chain stitch machines. So Mm. like things are made with uh, French seams or um, they're not like the double needle construction isn't, isn't chain stitched. And they had a chain stitch machine. So I was like, okay, this was great. I didn't even know I need that. And so then Ricky, Ricky kind of took me not under his wing, but he, he said, I will, I will make these shirts for you. And then I found out what a production pattern was. And I started working with this guy named Jay who was work, working for opening ceremony and works for a bunch of people in the garment district. And I still work with him today. I still, oh. work, I still work with both of them, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Um, and, uh, and so I had a, a production shirt and I, I had a pattern. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So I got, I got lucky. Um, so that was the first step. Yeah. And now you got to sell it. Yeah, now I have to sell it. <laughs> And so now, now I'm, uh, now I go back to school Okay. and I like, I've fully caught the bug. Like I fully, fully caught the bug and something else happened this summer. I'm also like an extraordinarily lucky person. Um, I just like met the right people in New York and somebody I met that was really important. Um, his name's David Alperin and he owns a boutique called Goose Barnacle in very, yeah. I met David a bunch of times mm-hmm. through, um, Brian Davis. Uh, wooden sleepers yeah yeah okay yeah and um this is a i've always been considered like a very lucky person this is like so i play a lot of soccer and i went to pier five or pier four whatever it is in brooklyn bridge park to play soccer and i signed up for a team and i think i went to the wrong field and ended up playing with a different team and that was david's team and afterwards uh we connected and we went to a bar in brooklyn heights for a beer and I told him, like, I was just like, I didn't know who he was. I had no idea who this person was. Wow. I was just like, I'm just like shooting the shit with strangers at a bar. It's very pleasant. Sure. And I'm like telling him what I'm trying to do. And he goes, oh, yeah, I own this men's clothing store next door. You should, uh, you, should you know, if you make anything, like, maybe we can work together. And I was like, uh, yes, please. And um, so... David became my first account. Oh, shit. Yeah. And like without, without David, like, I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure like any, any of this would have happened. So I go back to school, but now I'm like, I'm really caught the bug and I'm really interested in this. Um, and I'm going to New York. I'm taking the bus uh, down to New York every week. Okay. And also my family lives in Baltimore yeah. and DC. So this is the name for the, the brand corridor. Cause I'm like, now I'm always on the bus. There's, I'm always on the bus up and down the Northeast corridor. Oh shit. Yeah. I was kind of wondering, I was like, well, I don't know, that corridor is a rather unique name for that. I was like, you know, yeah. okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm always, I'm up on, I'm up, like I'm never basically at school anymore. I'm just on the bus up and down the corridor. What are you doing on the bus? Reading? <sighs> Reading, trying to do schoolwork, trying to figure this shit out okay um now i'm sourcing fabrics and i'm making shirts and i'm going back up to new york or going back up to boston and trying to sell these shirts to my classmates and because i started selling david's store now i'm selling in like three stores like three other stores like picked it up okay and uh, and you're not doing trade shows or anything at not, the time, not yet not yet okay um but i'm selling out of my backpack like <laughs> I have like, do you remember like when everyone had like this Duluth pack bag? Oh yeah. I had the big one and wow. I would stuff that full of shirts. Like every, I had 12 styles at the time and they were good. Most of them. 
And, <laughs> and, and so I would, any city I would go to, I'd like Google the men's shop and I'd like show up and I'd like dump it on their counter. And, and which is just not how people really do business. Just as a side note, it's a terrible way to do business. It's not bad. It's just not what people are used to. Oh yeah, sure. Um, but the, the, <laughs> the, the shirts were good. And so well, I, obviously people bought them. Yeah, I, I hope I hope so. Unless they're like somewhere. Um, but I, that's how I opened up like the first like twelve stores. Okay. And I would go to a, a city, and they would be like, "Yeah, these are good." And who are you selling to? Goose Barnacle. Okay. And they because that, that's a good cosign. I mean, David yes. has you know phenomenal taste. He really the the shop was always very well merchandise the brands that he carried i i put him in a in a, in a shop like say chcm exactly yeah yeah him and sweet too yeah exactly just fantastic merchants but real merchants um and real people yes yeah yeah i agree with with their own identity and taste and also thankfully that what their customers really believe and support mm-hmm. whenever sweet Two would get a brand or anything i'm like well it's here it must be good right um okay so you're you're in these shops you're yeah. selling stuff out of your your backpack yeah but you're still working um no i'm i'm in grad school oh excuse me you're, well yeah but you're still in you're still doing something else this isn't the the primary yeah, thing yeah. for you yeah and so basically by the end of that summer around the end of that summer uh, i'm selling to 12 really good stores and I, I meet a guy who has a showroom. This is, this is strange where it becomes like concurrent. So around this time, like I'm also like, you know, interviewing at the CIA and doing like these like, uh, like <laughs> online aptitude tests and things like that. And I'm, okay. And like, I'm like still like, I'm still hedging, of course, because I'm like, I don't have like, I don't have family money. I don't have like some investor who's going to like, just like, you know, make this thing happen. So I'm, I'm, I'm confused, okay. <laughs> you know, okay. I'm just, I'm just trying to make this thing happen. So, but I'm also, I'm also in grad school and spent a lot of money trying to become like a CIA agent, which, you know, obviously it never happened. So I, uh, I graduate and I go down to Langley and I do all that stuff. And what, what is all that stuff? I mean, you don't have to be hyper specific, but it, it's, just like in-person interviews and mm-hmm, tests mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. okay yeah and the before that like they they recruit you from school so you do like you do more or less interviews before you get there then you get invited to do online stuff and then you get down there but jeez but regardless i didn't get it i'm not a cia agent clearly and so wait you didn't get it because i, I didn't get it I didn't get it. Okay. I wasn't hired. If you would have, would you be sitting here? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Fair question. Yeah, I All don't right. know. So I'm like, well, what am I going to do now? Because I definitely can't make any money from these shirts, but I like doing these shirts mm-hmm. and I think this can be something. So I... But surely, by the way, you, you are extraordinarily qualified to go to any of these other contracting jobs which have pensions and are lucrative and and in a lot of ways extremely stable and secure no yeah or most likely the case would have been that i would have taken one of these contracting jobs and i learned from that first interview and i just would have gotten the second time around hopefully or third time around and that's that's what my career would have been sure and but i at this point i was like i really want to do this i really want to start this company um, I really want to make stuff. And I think that's kind of at the heart of Corridors. Like, I like making stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I took a job with this, this uh, intelligence contractor named Palantir. Cool. And, and Palantir is like this Peter Thiel company. It's a little bit like, like McKinsey for, uh, for, uh, McKinsey for our, uh, IT. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I worked there. Um, so I start working there and at the same time, so I moved to New York Okay, and I start with this, this, this company doing this stuff. And now I'm commuting to DC to work on, on these projects. Right. And I get picked up by the showroom. I like meet this guy uh, who has a showroom 
And he's like, okay, well, I'm going to take you to this capsule trade show and you're going to buy one rack and we're going to see how it goes more or less. Um, and I also at this time meet uh, my first employee who also now has equity in the company named Julia, uh, who starts helping me with production. Okay. So now it's like, it's starting to have a little bit more structure and we go to this trade show and what year is this? This is, uh, 2012 or 2013. Okay. And we do really well. We do really well. Um, you know, we, of course we pitch hickories and tradesmen LA and all, a lot of these stores that like are not, are not around, on, not around anymore, unfortunately, but we sell to like, I don't know, 24, or 32 stores the first season. Wow. Yeah. And so I'm not totally sure why, um, but I think this was 12, 12 shirts on a rack amongst, you know, you know, you know what capsule looks like. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of if you haven't been to a trade show, there's tons and tons of vendors all having basically the, the almost the same identical type of racks. And the only thing that makes each little area unique or different is just the clothes. But everything else is about the same. So you, you really are only selling and people are, are attracted to the physical clothes themselves. It's not a cool rug. It's not an iPad out front. It's the clothes, the objects are what sell at the end of the day. Yeah, you know. So I was thrilled by that, um, but uh, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. <laughs> and, you know, I'm using, like, my vacation days and, like, like essentially, like, sneaking out of the office to go up to production. And, um, and at this point, I spent all my money mm -hmm. on grad school. Mm -hmm. And so I... So you're running out of cash. There's no cash. The only cash comes from uh, my, my, my desk job right? That is, go that, is, that is going into the company. That's like, you know, paying, what, 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 you know, for everything. Sure. And so, but there's something there, you know. Um, there's something to the product that I'm making. And, uh, and yeah, so that was, I worked at that job for about two years before they like had enough of me. I think I was like missing too much work. Oh, okay. And I'm just one day I just get fired from this job and I'm like, fuck, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> like, oh shit. But at this point, like we were selling to like 60 stores. Like we was like, a, it was like a, re a real business in that sense. But there was still like, we're growing, we're growing. We're selling we're like this. We had like an online store. And when you grow, you need cash to grow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You need, that's, that's the biggest thing that people forget about and overlook whenever any brand grows. That's usually when they have to spend most of their money because it, it's a, quite a bit of risk to, um, follow the growth and mm -hmm. grow with that. And, and so many people, I think, especially new business owners forget that that is usually the hardest part. Yeah. And also like, it was just like really, I, for like two years, I was like working 19 hour days. Jeez. Because like the, the job was, that, that job was quite intense and, you know, designing and running the business was quite intense. So I was working out of my sixth floor walk up in the East Village with my roommate Richard and <laughs> our third bedroom, which okay. was like empty because like my other roommate was just never there, was the warehouse. Okay. Yeah. And so I would, you know, when we would get a, uh, do a, a trade show or get a, a delivery of, you know, I would go to the garment district and like, okay, we just made 32 more shirts. I would put it in the back of an Uber and go down to my apartment in the East Village. And then I would carry all those boxes up the six flights of stairs. Jeez. And like, I, I have this like distinct memory like of like knowing what it was like to feel like someone who was in the Midwest who's 70 years old and they're shoveling their driveway and their, their body is just going to give out. And like, just like the, the, the physical nature of also the business of just like moving boxes up yeah. and down those stairs. Yeah. And so that was, that was very, that was hard. That was a lot of work. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, uh, but the shirts were selling and I was, I was, I was exhilarated by that. 
and I was exhilarated by making more stuff. And I thought the stuff was getting better and cooler. And yeah. And so you lose your job. Yeah. You get this sort of, in a weird way, kind of lifeline wake up call. Mm. And the fact that now you, in most cases, do have this sort of fully formed other career that mm. you were doing. Mm-hmm. Do what? I mean, did that, did you think it was, now, looking back at it now, I guess, is, the, is losing your job what gave you that, that final like, kick to, to really make it a full-time thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, totally. I, it was like the best non-decision I've ever made. <laughs> I, I don't know how much longer it would have been, but when, when I went from some of my energy to all of my energy, the company just went, it started, it started moving much faster. Right. Yeah. And we're still working out of, uh, out of my sixth floor walk up and out of the garment district. Mm-hmm. And that's when things just like started, things just started happening. My eyes were a little bit wider and, uh, yeah. When is it that you start making like a full collection? Because if you look at corridor now, I mean, it, it's not just shirts and there's lots of stuff on there mm-hmm. and you know, you got Instagram accounts, you got social media. I mean, you, you are very much from at least my perspective, a fully formed brand Mm -hmm. that has all the clothes Mm -hmm. versus one specific thing. Yeah. Now we we have two stores in New York. Yeah. We have a a studio and we sell to 120 stores in 16 countries. It's like a, it's like a thing. When did that happen? It it happened progressively. Um, I think because I, I didn't come from a fashion background and because I didn't go to school for this and I've learned and I, I am learning like, mm-hmm. as I go. And so, so much of this is process. Like for me as a designer, like I'm like, feel like I'm just kind of beginning. And I think it moved from single beautiful objects to a collection about two or three seasons ago where I, I knew that I can make beautiful objects mm-hmm. um, to something that was a little bit, had more shape and, you know, had a cohesiveness to it. Mm. And, you know, all along we've started making pants and then we started making the sweatshirt and like, but that patchwork coat, by the way, that's like the, the, it, the it piece. Oh, thank like you. The past. I don't know. It's, it's sold out now, but it's, it's you, you just so folks know you, I'll put a link to it on the site or whatever, but there's this patchwork like overshirt type stuff. Because the one thing that I will say about your, your clothing and your brand is it, a lot of brands, when you see it, you're like, oh, that's head to toe this. Mm. And, and actually, I would say nowadays is not something that is as good as what it used to be because it can kind of be intimidating. And when I see Corridor and I look at what you have, it very much looks like a, the personal style of someone that is a little bit more open and welcoming versus this is my look head to toe and it's not accessible. Yeah, yeah. I think I, think I want to make... I, I want to make beautiful, like unpretentious clothing. Yeah. I want to make American clothing. I want to make something that is still though progressive and confronting. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of, it's only in the past about two years where I kind of learned the basics mm. about how to work in factories, how to work in mills. Uh, where can you get that? How can you make that? What are my constraints that you can really, you know, you know, begin to paint a little bit rather than just like, okay, this, I can just make this soft sweatshirt, but like, what can you really do with that sweatshirt? And so that's kind of where I think I'm, I'm moving and, you know, where the brand is moving. Interesting. So what year do you do your own retail store? Well, I was really lucky because I'd been doing pop-up flea you know, I'm there sure. you go. Yeah. So I, I had done pop-up fleas. I did Northern grade. Uh, and, and so I, I kind of knew that the product and from the wholesalers, I know the product sells really well in person. Um, so I know the guys from Billy Kirk and, Oh yeah. And, Chris and Kirk. Uh huh. Yeah. And you know, the brothers Bray and they invited me to share their store. And that was like a huge lifeline for me. So we were able to take one rack in their store in Lower East Side and Kyle and Rancourt was able to take one rack for his shoes. And I also was able to use their backstock area for my first office. 
So oh, dang. Yeah, so Julia and I had connecting desks in that back area that was very, very close to a bathroom. Uh, it was smaller than this room, so it was half, about half the size of this room, but it was an office and it wasn't in a walk-up. Okay. So that was, that was something that gave us some, you know, some more structure. And so that was the first time we had um, a retail space. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Anyone that I know that's ever gotten advice on their brand from Ralph Lauren, all of them have said that the, the best advice that he gave and always tells people is you really find out who your brand is when you have your own retail store, because it's not being merchandised by someone else. Even if, it, if it's, you know, being merchandised to your planogram, it's still, it's you, it's your identity and everything in that store is you. You, did that affect how you started designing the clothes when you start to, to be more submerged in your world? I think I started designing differently. Like when, when I f- started feeling more confident about becoming a designer, mm. you know, and that, that only happened more recently in, in the past two years. And, you know, I guess I could call myself a designer in 2013, but I was really just making shirts or just making pants and trying to make nice product. But I think like, I think when I started trusting myself a little bit more and like trusting my gut, because there's some things you can make that like, oh, well, that's easy. And you know, that's a win, you know, like the right Navy Hawaiian with the right space and the right color. And like, you're like, okay, yeah, that that's going to work. And this is, this is the right loftiness of the sweatshirt with the right melange. Yeah, that's going to work. And that's, mm. that's more like, that's more like commodity. And, you know, like you can do that. Um, but like, I think when I started really trusting my, my gut and really trusting myself, that's when I started changing. And that, that came from experience, like learning the basics and also just, um, just time. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, when you think about, you know, your brand and the story of your brand, especially from, you know, the outside, a, a lot of this, you know, I don't think people really realize what it truly, truly takes to take a brand from, you know, nothing to what it is now and the amount of sacrifice that it takes from you to do that. You know, so many people often talk about, oh, you just need an Instagram account, a lookbook, and you're good to go. But I mean, when did you start to to really believe that like you are a capital B brand and successful in the sense that you're selling at these places, you're making this stuff, but you know, were you starting to hit walls with like production? Because obviously when you're going from 12 to 30 shirts and when you're making shirts in the hundreds, that's, that's a big difference. Yeah. I mean, we had so many problems uh, with production. Um, production, especially in New York is very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, it's imperfect. Um, it's, very physical, um, and it's tiring and expensive and expensive. Yeah. Um, I mean like the, the, from the cash flow perspective, from the quality control perspective, like every Saturday, uh, Julie and I were there snipping threads. Like that's what you do. And, right. and you pack boxes, um, you know, in the factory, when the factory closes down, you turn off the lights, then you can pack boxes. So there's no operators there. Um, so there was, you know, there was a, there was a lot of issues, um, and there's a lot of issues with U.S. manufacturing generally. And I think one of the good things about doing it the way that I have done it is that I've kind of done everything mm-hmm. in, in the company from that perspective. Like, I've, I've worked in all the factories. I've been to all the pattern makers. I've, you know, like, I've done all these things. And so I can say very clear-headedly, um, what's good and what's not, what works and what doesn't. And I don't view things through a purely romantic lens. Mm. So like one of the things was, this was very difficult for us. We moved a lot of our shirt production to Philadelphia. So like in, in Philadelphia, we found a, a better shirt factory. Mm-hmm. And eventually like there was a huge pr- production mistake in, in Philadelphia. And, and eventually we moved it to India and like, moving it abroad was like for me, which was so tied to these people and these factories and like the story that, that was for me like a big, a big change. And, um, that, that was, you know, that was like a watershed moment for me. And Mm. the biggest thing, like 
for me, like opening my eyes to Indian production and manufacturing abroad was, was like, it just like opened my aperture so much. So like what you can do and the possibilities there and how you can be creative abroad um, was really like, was, was one of the big, was one of the big steps in being where we are today. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't give these other countries from Portugal to India and a lot of this stuff enough credit in the sense that they, they are not they as the whole country. I'll be try to be a little bit more careful with my words, but there are industries there that are much easier and scalable and more supportive for a brand that wants to experiment almost the entire vertical integrated process. And from the, the, the yarn, the textiles, the dyes, and then making it and people, and that, I don't think that exists in the United States. Not in a real way. I mean, it can be done in like, uh, for Jersey, for T-shirts, it can be done. Like in LA, to make uh, T-shirts, um, you, can make, you can make a lot of stuff. Um, maybe not incredible yarn dyes, and there's constraints. But when, when you work in a place that has the industry, mm-hmm. you can you just, you're, the world of possibility really, really opens up. So when we were making in New York, you only, you, you basically work with, mills and they produce a collection and then you go through that stack of swatches and you're like okay i'm gonna make that i'm gonna make that i'm gonna make that and my interest is like what i'm interested in is color and these different motifs and being creative with color and plaids and i just hit a wall in in u.s manufacturing because i can't make the fabrics Right. You can't make the fabrics You're relying here. upon a mill somewhere else anyway. Yeah, and you're choosing through the same stuff other people are choosing. and Which you see, especially with brands that are... And it's, it's happened to me yeah. and, and, and embarrassed me. And Really? Why would you take that as embarrassment? I think it's embarrassing because I want my product to be like my design. Like I want it to be mine. I want to okay. serve you something special. Okay. And so much of menswear is, you know... Uh, is the textile, mm. you know, like, yeah, sure. Like we're all going to wear blue Oxford shirts and you know, you got a blue <laughs> Oxford shirt on <laughs> and, it's, and it's great. Mm-hmm. But if you're wearing a, a special Hawaiian motif with like watercolor or some yarn dye behind it. And like, you're like, you bought that shirt because it, because of that motif, because that looks great. That's true. And then you see somebody else wearing it with a different brand. You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> I thought this was designed. I thought I de- it was designed for me. Right. And, it, and it, that's not, to me, that's not enough. Okay. And so I like, agree. I still sometimes buy textiles when I find something like so, so tasty, like I just need to have it. But I'll say to the mill, if somebody else chooses this, tell me because I won't, I won't make it. I spend a lot of time designing textile. So like so much of my work now is textile design. Interesting. And like, I just, I love it. I love doing it. Like, I love getting to the point where you're making something really, really special. Something that, like, it's like, to me, like, a textile is like a great sentence or a great paragraph, rather. Like, a great paragraph is something that has structure that keeps you in it, but continues to surprise you and the way that the eye moves through the pattern. And so that's, that's like a joy of mine that I, I now get to do. Interesting. Yeah. So fast forward to where you are now. Mm. I mean, you're obviously not traveling with a backpack. You're showing in Paris. You're, you know, you're showing in other countries. You're manufacturing across the globe. Do you still have that same sort of kind of grassroots sort of hustle mindset with things? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. We still have no investors. Really? Yeah, we have no investors. So it, you're, you're, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I actually seriously had no idea. <laughs> yeah, we have no investors. Everything is bootstrapped. Um, and so I think the clothes are like, like I really want the clothes and to be authentic. Like I really want them to feel like the company to feel. And I think that there are, there are huge drawbacks to, to, to doing that, like to being bootstrapped. Um, some things aren't as nice as they should be. Like, you know, the table in our, 
in our shop is, is basically like plywood that we bought in Chinatown. And it's okay. But of course, I want a nicer table. Maybe we'll get to that this year. Um, oh. But there's, there's, there's choices that one makes in that. Um, and I remember like, I really needed, I really needed some money. And I, I went to my father and I was like, can you, can you, can you help? And he's like, no way. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I yeah. mean, oh man, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It was, it was such a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, because I don't have friends and family invested, because I don't have, you know, it makes everything simpler. Like my life, I don't have, I don't report to a board. I don't report to like my buddy from high school that like, okay, this is what we did on our P&L. No, like we can just go at our pace and make the product we want to make and, and just grow in the way that we're supposed to. Like I keep going back. Like I want the, I want the brand to feel natural. I want the clothes to feel natural. And I think like when you, for me anyway, it wouldn't feel natural if I felt I needed to put, you know, something on the fire to make it burn faster. Right. Yeah. I think that's true. A lot of brands, no matter what they are now, whether they're selling kitchenware or whatever it is, there's so much growth expectation that they have to hit by certain years. And it's because they are getting outside capital. They, they have to be it here. They have to be it here. And I do think there's, you're right, there's a, a strong luxury and I would say a, a much stronger personal connection that consumers and, you know, your clients would have to your brand because it, it just is this slower organic growth, but it's more stable. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, have a, we have a very stable business. Like, I, I run like a 1950s style business. <laughs> No, seriously. Like we do trade shows. Okay. We do pre-book. We we sell from our stores. We make a really honest product. We sell it at a really honest price. Like it's like a really, it's like a really old school business model. Right. Yeah. It's like people were probably doing exactly this in nineteen fifties, or you know they are still today. But you know that's that's just how it's being run now. Wow. Okay. So. Let me ask you this now. Do you feel that you are a successful designer now? No. I will. I think I will be. Yeah, I think I will be. What will it take for you to feel that you are when I, you feel I, that? I think when I think the work is good enough, you know, when I think, I think the work is getting there. Yeah. Yeah. How do you judge that? Um, I have a very specific taste. Mm. And I think when the work doesn't exactly match my taste or our visuals, because, you know, the work is the brand, right? The work is not simply the clothes. And sometimes a, a garment hits it, but maybe the photography is, isn't exactly, it's too modely or it's too slick or it's too rough or it's um, too masculine or, you know, okay. like what, what I'm, what I'm looking for, like this like specific taste that I have. I think when I, when I hit that, like where, like I can, you know, w when, the, when it's just right, I think I'll feel that. What are you going to do when you feel you're successful then? I will try to repeat it uh -oh. and I'll continue <laughs> through the process of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think, it, you know, there's, there's a certain mindset and I, I wrestle with this too, which is why I was, you know, so curious in asking uh, you these questions because having this sort of sense that it's never complete is a really wonderful thing in terms of like your work ethic. But I often feel that I can never enjoy the fruits of my labor when I have that mindset as well. Do you ever wrestle with that? Like you made something. Okay, let's talk about that patchwork jacket. That patchwork jacket is awesome. Is it, you know, like, do you ever sit after you made something, you did a good job and you're like, oh, I did it. Let me just savor what this feels like to do this good job or is it nope nose to the grindstone let's get back to work no i i totally savor it okay we made this double jersey al baby alpaca blazer cardigan overshirt thing in peru this season 
and we got the sample in and I was like, fuck, <laughs> this is fucking good. Okay. Good, you know, good. and like, I like jump around and I'm like very, very, I'm so happy yeah. when I, when I hit it. Yeah, yeah. I'm super, super happy. And like, I, I, I know when, uh, when it's good, I, it's, it's good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Something that's also kind of happening a lot now when you think about these like Instagram brands that are all kind of starting up, they have these basically manufactured at a creative agency story, you know, the same typeface, the same sort of like, how do you feel about these, this like rise of these new sort of like faux inauthentic brands that have been starting these days, clothing or, you know, we cut out the middleman type thing now. I think for me, Instagram is really important to know how people are communicating and mm-hmm. how um, marketing is changing and how aesthetics are changing. But from a comparative standpoint, it's really bad. Like for me to look at Instagram and to look at other brands and it's not good for me. Mm. So I really, I really shy away from uh, looking, looking too much. Mm. And so I don't, I don't really indulge that. Yeah. I think that's a pretty wise thing. I think (laughs) history will judge this, but down the road, I imagine I see more and more people trying to find ways to not be so saturated with everything that's being pummeled at them on, on digital and social media. Yeah. But you can't turn it off. Some people I know just turn it off. They're like, I'm not going to do Instagram. I'm not going to do Facebook, but I think there's, there's, they're valuable. So I think yeah. there needs to be, there, it's a continuum. And for me, I think I know where I need to be. And there's days in which I'm like, oh, I saw something that made me feel a certain, a certain way. And I delete the app. I'll delete it for a couple of days. So mm. I like, cause like, I don't want to, I don't want to feel that. I don't want to feel envy. I don't want to feel jealousy. And it's silly that like perhaps something scrolling on my phone made me feel that way. So mm. I'm, I'm careful to try to stay away from that. Well, sir, Mr. Dan. This has been very, very, very good. But I just want to say thank you to you for, for having me on. Of course. And thank you to any listeners that listen to this that know Corridor, looked at it. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to, to you guys and, and to you, Jeremy. Oh, cool. Well, good. Well, it was a pleasure. All right, talk to you soon. You've been listening to Blamo. Our theme music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. Editing by Brendan Finn, and we're produced by Blamo Media. Follow along with us on Instagram at Blamo Podcast and leave a review for us on your favorite podcast app. Want even more Blamo? Head over to patreon.com forward slash Blamo to join the Blam fam and get access to additional interviews, a community slack, special events, and more. And best of all, you're supporting the show. Try it. It feels good. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week.